Chasing Leviathan is a podcast about pursuing truth, one big question at a time through the discipline of listening. Truth is too big to tame. But if we pay close attention, we might get the chance to glimpse something truly magnificent. So please join me in this pursuit, one week at a time. Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm PJ Weary, your host with Dr. Noel Car- uh, Carroll today uh, out at the City University of New York. He is a distinguished professor of philosophy and film studies there. Uh, Dr. Carroll, so glad to have you on today. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. And today we're talking about um, your newly released book, Classics in Western Philosophy of Art. Um, I. Your career uh, speaks for itself. Um, I have several of your books on my bookshelf. Why this book? What led you to write this book in particular? I think one thing that led me to um, write it is uh, there's there's a a kind of constant through line that uh, has preoccupied me as a philosopher, uh, a philosopher of art. Uh, And um, I wanted to... uh, provide um, a broad historical context for it. It it has to do um, with uh, a a, a conception of art um, that dominated the art world uh, when I first joined it uh, as as a youngster uh, in in the late 60s and early 70s. And it was dominated by a kind of a, a formalistic view uh, mm. that that art was about itself, uh, that it was for its own sake, uh, especially in in the world of fine art, in the in the gal- gallery arts situation. Uh, it was a time when it was uh, um, uh, broadly conceptualized uh, that um, artworks were were it, what they were really about were defining what art is. In, in that sense, it, it, they were reflexive. They were about themselves. Uh, and uh, they, that went along with uh, a, a way in which I, I was taught to read literature, which was uh, called the new criticism, even though it was kind of old by the time I was being taught it. <laughs> uh, and, and that was a view that uh, 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 literature, especially poetry, that was always their best example, uh, that poetry um, was uh, not about what the author intended. It was not about um, uh, arousing emotions in in, in the viewer. Um, it was not about, uh, for example, uh, the conditions that led it to be made. Uh, um, in, in other words, uh, Marxist criticism, for example, was uh, out of bounds. Uh, there was a kind of view, and I, I'll use this word now, uh, that art was autonomous. Uh, that it was a, a realm unto itself, and and this also was a, a view uh, that was sometimes explicitly uh, endorsed by philosophers like Monroe Beardsley, uh, but also was uh, implicit in uh, many of the things that uh, 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 philosophers just thought uh, were intuitive. Uh, the notion, for example, that uh, uh, authorial intentions were irrelevant to the the, the work, work of art, uh, uh, or irrelevant to the uh, appropriate way of appreciating works of art. Uh, you, weren't, you didn't want to know about uh, what the uh, author intended. You wanted to know uh, what the words on the page meant. Um, so so these, these views were very in, in, entrenched, and um, uh, I, I was, uh, uh, for a, a certain period of time, uh, uh, su- seduced and convinced by them. Uh, but as often has happened to me when I uh, uh, begin to have to teach something and explain and convince other people about it, um, I began to uh, um, worry about it. Um, I like to tell my students that often uh, I, I know where all the bodies are buried. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, gradually, um, in a piecemeal sort of way, 
I, I balked against a, a, a number of these, uh, uh, let's call them intuitions that art theorists and art philosophers had, uh, and began to push back. Uh, I pushed back against the idea that uh, um, uh, art was uh, separate from uh, moral questions, uh, that uh, they were, uh, art was uh, uh, not really involved in making cognitive or intellectual uh, uh, contributions other than um, uh, uh, about the, the status of art itself. Um, I, I began to worry about the claims of denying the relevance of authorial intention. And uh, there was also something that was called the effective fallacy that suggested art was not about arousing emotions. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, many of the things that I just took for granted be before I became educated. Uh, and so I began to uh, uh, look uh, for... Uh, philosophical arguments and considerations uh, to push back against the, the, this uh, framework that I'm broadly calling or, autonomism. Uh, and uh, getting uh, back to your question, um, uh, th this book uh, ab about uh, the classics of Western art is, is an attempt to show that uh, uh, this uh, 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 relation, this tension between being uh, uh, an autonomist about art uh, and being the opposite of that, which I'll call a heteronomist, hetero meaning other, uh, auto meaning self. Uh, the autonomist uh, thinks of art as about itself. Um, the heteronomist, uh, that's me, thinks about uh, it as being in, a, in, in a, a conversation with the wider culture and the concerns of the wider culture. Uh, so uh, this book uh, uh, is an attempt to uh, place that in the context of a long view. So I have to make a confession, um, though it's couched as an introduction, um, it also has uh, an agenda and, and tries to make a number of kinds of con uh, um, uh, connections that um, are not the sort of connections that would be made uh, in an introduction. So it, it, it's written in a way that uh, I hope anyone can pick it up or look, not anyone, but anyone who's kind of seriously cons concerned about art can, can pick it up and, and profit. Uh, but also if, if you're more steeped in the debates, uh, there's, there's, something, there's something for you as, as well. Um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, there's, a, there's this ar ar argument uh, uh, meant to, uh, uh, in one sense, uh, reveal uh, uh, that some of the things that philosophers take as intuitions are, are actually um, theoretical choices. Um, the econ economist uh, John Maynard Gain, uh, Keynes once said that Every time a businessman tells you uh, uh, some great principle of economics, what, what he's actually doing, unbeknownst to himself, is, is quoting some long-dead economist. And he's, uh, uh, it, what, what his intuition is is actually a piece of theory. Uh, and I'm trying to uh, uh, unmask or uh, trying to... Uh, disclose or reveal uh, that a lot of things that the philosophical institution uh, 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 or practitioners therein take as their intuitions is a actually a, a, a reflection of um, some uh, 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 views in the past that uh, uh, I, I try to contest uh, in, in the book. Now, let me just say uh, one more uh, thing about context. Um, uh, a lot of you listeners, maybe you uh, yourself, uh, uh, are saying to yourself, well, I mean, since the 70s, uh, the humanities in general, um, not philosophy, but the rest of humanities has really uh, uh, just taken it as given. Uh, there's Marxism, feminism, um, uh, post-colonialism, race studies. Uh, in every way, it seems like uh, the the humanities have been uh, sold uh, uh, on uh, this thing that I'm so exercised about that, and I, I think that's that 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 is that is true. Um, 
in my own way, I, I too am a child of the 60s. Uh, but uh, in, 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 in my little uh, neighborhood, in the philosophical neighborhood, um, uh, there's, uh, uh, the philosophical na- neighborhood has, has not moved as quickly uh, out of the shadows of, of formalism and autonomism as, as the rest of the humanities. So um, uh, in, 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 the, in the turf I live on, uh, it, it's still a, a, a battle. Um, and of course, it's, it's a battle that has to be fought uh, according to the criteria of, of proof and argumentation uh, of, uh, of philosophy. Um, which, uh, you know, without trying to give philosophers a pat on the back, um, is, is sometimes uh, more, more strenuous uh, than, than other, uh, other disciplines. Um, also, of course, Hegel once uh, had a beautiful observation. Um, he said, the, the owl Minerva spreads its wings at dusk, um, and then philosophy paints its gray and gray. And what he means by that is, uh, uh, you know, f- philosophy can only take hold um, after something is is over. <laughs> uh, f- philosophy uh, sp- spreads its wings at dusk um, when uh, the day is done. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, philosophy uh, spreads its wings at dusk. Um, uh, in in my case is. Uh, after the period uh, of, of what autonomism um, uh, has already uh, uh, began to become in battle. In, in, in writings by people like Arthur Danto, uh, who was a, a, a very um, influential, not only philosopher of art, but a, a very distinguished art critic. He won the National Book Award for his uh, criticism, which he um, wrote f- for the journal uh, the uh, the Nation for for more than twenty years, and uh, his theory, uh, interestingly, of the end of art, um, uh, of is is after Minerva has spread its wings, uh, uh, and uh, it, it is uh, 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 an approach to art uh, that is developed after what we could call high modernism uh, had uh, been uh, displaced uh, by uh, uh, what, for obvious reasons, was called postmodernism. Right, absolutely. Uh, even as uh, I'm sitting here, one, I definitely would love to come back to what were some of the key moments of change? Because you talked about yourself being an autonomist and changing to be a heteronomist. And you mentioned probably about seven or eight very important issues that you changed your mind about. And I'd love to hear, you know, if, yeah, sometimes that's a gradual thing, but sometimes those can be uh, moments of illumination. So I want to come back to that. But uh, first, even as we look at the book, um, and uh, this almost feels like an unfair question, especially starting with the first two, but how did you choose which philosophers to include in the book? And obviously you have Plato and Aristotle as the first two, and a uh, that seems like a dumb question in regards to Plato and Aristotle. But as you looked at this, who were, why did you choose the people that you did for um, the different chapters of the book, the different selections you thought were essential for someone being introduced to the philosophy of art? Well, um, to a certain extent, w- what I did was uh, look, looked at a, a, a lot of uh, anthologies. Uh, in other words, what people were being taught um, and uh, I took it that that some somehow th- that uh, gave us something like uh, oh I I I don't know uh, I've used th- different concepts they're all metaphors but it it, it reveals something like the the unconscious or uh, the uh, the, the operating cognitive stock that you need uh, to begin to uh, 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 join in the conversation. Now, uh, let me say, uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle, as, as you remarked, well, that, that's, that's kind of a, a no-brainer. Um, the, then there's, there's Hume, uh, uh, not only because he's an eminent philosopher, but because uh, he, he wrote a book, uh, not a book, he wrote an article called The Standard of Taste, um, which uh, uh, 
is 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 extremely important and uh, among other things uh, could be said to have been uh, uh, one of the many things that uh, as a result of his uh, uh, addressing them um, awakened Kant from his uh, uh, dogmatic slumbers and and uh, uh, Kant I think everyone would agree is an absolutely key key figure in 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 the discussion of what's called aesthetics. Um, uh, Schopenhauer, uh, at least in uh, uh, Germany, was often considered to be, uh, although this is completely wrong, but he was considered to be um, a more user-friendly version of Kant. Um, and <laughs> uh, I would like to make a, a, a claim uh, that that he's a pivotal feature in uh, the uh, uh, emergence of, of what I was calling autonomism. Uh, Tolstoy and Bell, they often turn, turn out in, in uh, these anthologies as well. Um, I think the one person who it might seem uh, peculiar that I included is Francis Hutchinson. Uh, and I, I do uh, include him because al although he's not a name as well known as the others uh, that I've cited, uh, he introduced, or he didn't actually introduce it, but he, he popularized the notion of uh, uh, disinterested pleasure. That that mm. what aesthetic pleasure that that what marks uh, 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 the aesthetic is uh, uh, that it's disinterested. Now this is this is key to uh, the evolution of uh, what I'm calling autonomism. Uh, when Hutchinson used the idea of disinterested, he was just using it in the in in the the, the sense that's probably uh, uh, natural to most to think of at first. Uh, he meant uh, uh, not personally interested. So uh, we expect a judge not to be personally interested. We want the judge to recuse herself if uh, you know she's making a. Uh, a, a ruling about um, a, a piece of property, and, and she happens to be one of the investors in one of the pieces of property. Well, when uh, we, we take pleasure from lots of things, um, uh, Hutchinson said he didn't use the, the term aesthetic, he used the term taste. But when we made judgments of taste uh, 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 of, of the sort that now we call aesthetic, he said they had to be disinterested. So what he meant by that was when you uh, uh, go to a dance recital, the, the pleasure you take from it um, isn't that the, the, uh, the, the young woman on stage is your daughter, right? <laughs> or, or, or when you, in, in um, um, foliage season, when you go out and you look in exp at an expanse of forest and you're, you're just, wow. You, you you take delight from it. You're not taking from the delight from the fact that you own the property, and that that this is going to make it more valuable. That when people come in, in autumn and they go, I, I just have to own this because it's so beautiful. Uh, so what he that's what he meant by disinterested. Uh, it it wasn't uh, a, a personal benefit to you. However, uh, for all kinds of reasons that we we can go if. You, it, uh, if you want to, but I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, Kant widely expanded the notion of, of disinterested. So yeah. he, he thought, well, uh, a truly disinterested pleasure couldn't Im Im involve morality. Uh, it couldn't in in involve uh, uh, cognition. Uh, you, you weren't taking pleasure from something because you learned something from it. You weren't... Uh, taking pleasure uh, 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 from it because it was morally good. Um, it was uh, a pleasure that, that was disinterested. Um, it, 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 was, it wasn't connected to anything else. So when you went out and, and you saw the, the sunrise, you, you just wanted to look at it because it gave you uh, a pleasure, not, not because it revealed any secrets of the universe uh, to you, um, not because you, you thought, uh, about uh, how uh, it's necessary for the sustenance of the human race, etc. But but uh, you just took pleasure from it. You just couldn't take your eyes off of it. Uh, and and as well, it was disinterested in the sense that Hutchinson made. Now you can see 
you just need to make one small step. And that is, if you think that what art is, what it's about is to uh, uh, afford your having experiences that are experiences of disinterested pleasure, then art is automatically disconnected from morality, from cognition, from from all all, all of those those entanglements with the with the wider culture, because now they're being counted as interests. And by the way, people did make that mistake. We even know who made the mistake. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 a young graduate student who was a uh, Scottish graduate student who was studying with Schiller um, attended the salon of Madame de Stahl and her, her lover, Benjamin Constant. And, and when uh, this graduate student tried to explain Kant's view to Benjamin Constant, uh, Benjamin Constant understood it as uh, 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 w- understood it in terms of the slogan that we now know: uh, 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 "Lart pour l'art, art for art, art for art's sake." That's what he took Kant to be saying. That wasn't what Kant was saying. Kant wasn't really talking about art. His real example of dis- uh, disinterested pleasure was. The kind of pleasure we take um, uh, when we can't take our eyes off the the natural beauty of, of foliage season, but but uh, uh, you know, constant connected it to art, uh, and uh, this was very influential uh, in the French tradition, especially in the early nineteenth century. It it crossed the uh, uh, channel. Uh, with uh, uh, people in England like Walter Pater and and Whistler, and most famously, most famously Oscar Wilde. I was just who, the, uh, begin, I'm glad who you in said the it. preface who in the preface to um, the preface to his book, the the picture of Dorian Gray, uh, says that you know uh, 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 books are not good or bad. There he means morally good or bad. They are well written or not. Now, now it's a kind of astounding because you would think, isn't the picture of Dorian Gray an incredibly moralistic book? I mean, it talk about talk about uh, evil being <laughs> punished. Talk about a, a lesson. Uh, th- oh, that's man. it. And. Um, uh, uh, if if anyone, uh, the man who seduces, uh, uh, I, I forget the name of the uh, uh, aristocrat uh, for the moment, uh, uh, who seduces, he seems to get all the best lines in the book, but in the Lord end, Henry Cotton? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he gets all the best lines in the book, but, you know, uh, uh, Dorian is, is punished. Anyway, uh, uh, when people pointed this out to... Uh, uh, Wild, he said, "No, no, no. You know, good and bad are, are to uh, a, a writer what what uh, colors are to a painter. You know, they they in other in other words, uh, good good and bad gives you a pretty good plot structure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and yeah. and um, so uh, that's that's how he he dealt with the uh, apparent irony." of this incredibly moralistic text that that seems to be teaching a moral lesson. It wasn't didactic at all. Um, Anyway, uh, to to get back to my my book, um, uh, uh, I think that someone like Clive Bell, who I end with, um, is uh, uh, the the most uh, sophisticated uh, formalist of, of, of the time. Uh, uh, his uh, uh, argument uh, for uh, art really just being about um, the kind of special uh, emotion that that the formal structures in an artwork can uh, uh, elicit um, uh, it gives uh, an, uh, not only an argument uh, um, for uh, autonomism, and this might be even more important. He, he he presents philosophers with a problem 
that he solves. Uh, the, his, the problem he presents uh, philosophers is, you know, he says, well, uh, if we can't define art, we gibber, which means we don't know what we're talking about. And, and uh, then he goes on to give us a definition of what art is. Uh, art, art is uh, uh, something that possesses significant form. Uh, and then uh, he tells you what uh, uh, s significant form is. It, it's a, 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 the kind of structures in a painting, say uh, symmetries, for example, uh, that uh, 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 afford or arouse what he calls the aesthetic emotion which he doesn't want to use the word beauty and he doesn't want to use the word uh, uh, pleasure. So he, he calls it by a new name, aesthetic emotion. But aesthetic emotion is, and this is where Schopenhauer comes into the story, aesthetic emotion is what lifts us out of the concerns of everyday life, uh, like moral concerns, like uh, uh, cognitive concerns, like political concerns, like religious concerns, um, and uh, 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 serves up uh, 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 autonomism on a, on a platter. That's why I end the book with uh, with Bell because uh, Bell is an earlier is an early example of uh, the the kind of uh, autonomism. Uh, that I uh, earlier claimed is uh, embedded in the unconscious of the philosophical institution, or at least the Anglo-American philosophical institution um, uh, that I uh, uh, want 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 to uh, 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 attack, like uh, Don Quixote after windmills. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's so much. Um... In what you said, that it's one absolutely fascinating, um, and and just gets me thinking. Uh, as you're talking about Oscar Wilde, uh, it does strike me that good and bad does make a good plot structure. So he's not wrong, uh, but the, and of course I have the benefit of uh, uh, a lot of hindsight of of a lot of history and philosophical training following Oscar Wilde, but. Uh, and, and I'd be curious to, answer, to hear your answer to this question. Why does good and bad make a good plot structure? And do you think that's part of uh, the difference between autonomism and heteronomy or heteronomous? Why does it make a good plot structure? Um, well, uh, this is a kind of generic example which would need a lot of qualification, uh, modification. But uh, l let me give you a, a, a first a, a approximation, and then you can you can uh, 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 if you want uh, say what about um, right. So here's why it makes a very good plot structure. Um, think of think of suspense. Uh, which is very often a, a, a component in, in uh, uh, a good plot. Uh, I don't want to say suspense is the only uh, uh, important plot structure, but, but it's, a, it's a pretty uh, regularly recurring one. Um, so what, what does it take to get uh, the audience to feel suspense? Um, well, it, it, the audience has to have a kind of stake in the fact that the the person who uh, we feel this suspense about uh, uh, is 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 worthy of of it. Look, if it was Hitler who was tied on the railroad tracks uh, uh, and the train was coming, rather than the damsel in distress or or Mother Teresa for that matter, <laughs> if it were Hitler. Um, we wouldn't be feeling suspense. We would be kind of hoping the train could move even faster. Whereas we, when we have suspense, we want it to slow down and give 
give uh, uh, the hero a chance to rescue the damsel in distress. Or, or if she's a very able uh, damsel, we want her to have time so that she can, you know, untie herself with her teeth or something before yeah. the train runs over her. Okay, but but that means we have to have a stake in uh, the damsel, and and what what uh, what would be a good way of getting us to care about what happens to the damsel? Well, if we were morally aligned with her, uh, we we would take pleasure uh, we would take pleasure when uh, her. Uh, ambitions succeed and and we would uh, uh resist when obstacles were put in in her way um so w- what's a way of getting us to align uh with uh the people who are the objects of suspense who in other words let's just call that person a protagonist what makes us pro to protagonists well one thing if we're morally aligned to them so that's one reason why uh, 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 good and evil is is a a, 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 a very flo- functional uh, and efficient plot structure. Forget about what's good and bad. Just you were asking what makes it a good plot structure. That that's partly what makes it a good stu- structure because it, it it aligns you in the right way so that you feel uh, frustration and sometimes anger when obstacles are put in, in, in the way of some characters, uh, and you feel hope when, when they're threatened, and you feel gratification when they succeed. Uh, so uh, uh, m- morality uh, uh, gives us uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the wherewithal uh, for the author or the creator uh, to uh, get the alignment the emotional alignment they need in the audience in the right way. Now, there are other ways of doing it. Uh, As I said, this requires lots of uh, qualification. But but, uh, I think all I need to answer you in the moment is to to give you one kind of uh, um, example of of why uh, 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 good versus evil is a good plot structure. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Uh, The answer is psychological. It, 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 it. Yes, and that makes that makes perfect sense. Though my one quibble with your example is, I think that people would feel suspense if Hitler was on the train track, but it would be whether or not he actually gets run over because they want him to get run over. <laughs> well, wait, they they yeah. might feel suspense if if you know uh, members instead of the seventh. I cavalry, hope he doesn't get away. It, it <laughs> Sorry, was the Gestapo. Uh, and, yeah, and the yeah. Gestapo was coming, <laughs> and it looked like the Gestapo might have a chance of succeeding. <laughs> but you see, what I didn't include in the story was that the uh, suspense also, uh, 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 as well as it having an alignment mm. uh, uh, factor, uh, yes, also um, also has a probability factor, right. So uh, the uh, it has to be probable, uh, or, or uh, it has to be improbable that the heroine is going to be rescued. Uh, you know, every time uh, uh, the uh, rescuers get closer, uh, suddenly uh, they have to stop for a railroad train. Uh, or, 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 or there's something that's in in their way, so that you make it that you in, the good is imperiled, uh, uh, and it's improbable, or no more probable than uh, uh, the victory of the bad uh, uh, for for that to take hold. So if you jigger those things, if you play around with the probability and the morality. Uh, uh, things. If if you make it uh, more probable that the bad is going to su- succeed, uh, uh, then then uh, uh, or, I'm sorry. If you make it if 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 you put Hitler in the position of the classical uh, uh, damsel in distress, uh, uh, then 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 uh, uh, you'll be playing with the audience's 
moral sentiments, their disalignment, uh, in a way uh, uh, that will get you su suspense. Uh, but the suspense then is not about uh, you're wanting him to be saved. Yes. Your suspense it's is about, about your moral commitment wanting him not to be saved. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I love that. Um, and I do think that this is uh, a really interesting kind of access point to the heteronomist and auto autonomous debate because on the one hand, it seems that, uh, and, and maybe I'm wrong here, and I'd be curious uh, as far as like a, a clarification, you know, if I, I'm, I'm tracking with you, the heteronomist would look at this and say that art is giving us space to reflect on the on the good and the bad and that that is intricately connected to the values of art and that and that's why we're aligned in there and for the autonomous they'd say that the good and the bad are merely there in that case to serve the pleasure that art gives is that is that a fair summation of of the the contest that's going on here well, that, that's that's that definitely you've you've hit nail on the head. That is one one uh, that that's one uh, very important line of of tension. So the uh, let let's call the heteronomist, or we could even call him a moralist in this case. The moralist says, "Look, when when dealing with fictions, um, you know." Uh, Readers, viewers, listeners um, are really uh, constantly involved in making moral judgments about 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 characters and actions and, and whatever. Uh, you, know, you couldn't understand uh, 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 many of the novels of your culture uh, unless you were uh, kind of uh, making moral judgments. Uh, uh, usually of the sort that that the the author actually uh, anticipates and and is 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 trying to uh, 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 structure. Uh, okay, so that that's what the heteronomous says, and 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 then the autonomous says, yeah, yeah, but you know, uh, Oscar Wilde was right. Uh, it's just the device, right? It, it it it's it's like using a rhyme scheme. Uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, it, it, it's really a, a formal structure, um, and you know, uh, in a given work, it's it's either an interesting and effective structure or it's not. But it's really it's all all about uh, it's all about it's all about art. Um, well, now, what can the autonomist or the moralist say? Um, we have to be careful about what what the uh, argument is. I mean, in, in in some cases, actually, the the autonomist is is going to be right. Uh, uh, that is to say, uh, that maybe in 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 certain uh, uh, spy films, there there really isn't uh, uh, um, uh, more more the more the the morality in question is 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 just there. Uh, 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 to 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 perform a formal function, uh, uh, but now the autonomous might say something stronger, and this is where the issue will arise, and that is that look, it's always just a formal consideration. In that sense, it, it it's all, always uh, uh, artistically uh, irrelevant. It never makes an artistic difference you, the, an artwork is never less good as an artwork because it's immoral right it, it's never it's never going to be a defect in an artwork that it's immoral uh it, it's only ever going to be a formal or a psychological mistake and now the moralist has to actually uh uh, try and 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 find uh, at least some cases where that's going to be false. It doesn't. Uh, the moralist doesn't have to be uh, uh, radical and say uh, every time uh, there's uh, something immoral in a work of art, uh, uh, that's uh, that's an artistic defect. Uh, uh, because actually the uh, 
the autonomous wants to be careful too. The the autonomous do, doesn't ever want, doesn't want to say that uh, any any uh, uh, moralism in a, in a work is an artistic defect. He just he just wants to say that look, it's never going to be the fa- case that an, a moral defect will count as an artistic defect. Okay, well, here, here's a reason why that might not be, be true. Um, and it goes back to some things we've talked about al- already. Um, and, and actually is first observed in, in Aristotle's Poetics, which is discussed in my book, uh, and, and, uh, and is a brilliant insight. A- Aristotle points out, uh, and, and I was actually relying on Aristotle and what I just, just said about narrative. Uh, Aristotle says, look, um, the, for him, the point of what he was analyzing, which was tragedy, for Aristotle, the, the point of tragedy is to call, cause uh, uh, or arouse the, the emotions of pity and fear. And he says, look, it takes a certain kind of character to elicit pity and fear. Um, you don't want a character who's a saint to uh, be the victim of tragedy. Tragedy for Aristotle re- really is about bad things happening to good people, right? So you don't want you don't want a saintly person uh, uh, to 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 become the victim of of tragedy because you won't feel uh, uh, you 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 won't, you won't feel what you're supposed to be feeling, what you'll feel is indignation and outrage, right? I mean, if you, you, you I don't know, think, think of uh, uh, a very uh, saintly person, maybe Gandhi, uh, when, if he befalls tragedy, uh, uh, you, you, you don't feel pity, you feel indignation, there's something wrong with the universe. So you can't have a saint to be the object of tragedy, and you can't have a villain. That goes back to my Hitler example. Uh, uh, if, if Hitler is is going to become the the the, the victim of a, a tragic outcome, you're going to be saying, "Yeah, it was a just desserts." So, yeah. so Aristotle yeah. thing, says you have to, and now think about this: you, you have to design your character in a certain way so that it, the character will be appropriate. And that has to be a character who isn't a saint and who isn't a villain, who's kind of halfway between uh, 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 them, who's more like us. You know, not too bad and not too good. Um, and uh, is someone like Oedipus who, uh, through no fault of his own, uh, has killed his father and, and, and uh, slept with his, his, his mother. You know, Oedipus uh, knew the the prophecy that he would do those things, but he thought his mother and father uh, were the king and queen of Corinth. So right. he left Corinth and went to Thebes. <laughs> he didn't realize <laughs> that, that he was walking right into it. He, he was right. trying to do what was right. Uh, so he actually was a good person, and it, as we know, something bad befell him. Okay, but what's the point of all this? The point of all of this is you ha- the, to, to get uh, what is the artistic aim of a work requires uh, that you design your characters the right way, and so uh, uh, it it would it, it would be a more, an artistic mistake if you made the character in such a way that you weren't going to facilitate the the aim or purpose of or function of the work, right? So imagine we tried to uh, 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 make a film or, or uh, write a novel in which um, we, we posited a, a civilization um, in which killing innocent children was good, right? Well, uh, that's a morally <laughs> defective view for, for, for most viewers or most readers. Uh, and they, I would hope they, for the they, listeners on my podcast, that would be a morally defective view. Yes. <laughs> very good. Uh, you have a very uh, moral, moral uh, audience. Uh, so look, if you design the characters in that way, um, 
you wouldn't get the uptake, the artistic uptake that you want. But that would be a failure of, of your artistic design. So where I think I've gotten, or what I've tried to get at is, sometimes a moral defect mm -hmm. actually is an artistic defect, which yeah. is what we were trying to, uh, was, the, the, was the, the commitment we were trying to uh, uh, challenge that the autonomous right. was uh, uh, putting forward. Um, that sometimes it's not just a matter of, uh, 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 sometimes it's not just, just a, a, a matter of formalism. Uh, uh, so, sometimes actually uh, a morally defective viewpoint uh, is an artistic uh, de defect. Um, see, I, I don't want to go entirely in the other direction and say, well, a, a moral defect is always an artistic defect. But sometimes it is, and and that's what what you need to defeat um, a, at least uh, a, a, a non radical uh, autonomous. Hmm. Yeah, I, and I, I talked to Dr. Michael Clune on an earlier episode about uh, he was writing a defense of judgment in the um, the language arts in the humanities. And one of the things he talked about is that art creates space for us to suspend our own values so that we can learn, right? That it's that, that kind of play and, and cognition. And that kind of uh, reminds me a little bit of what you're, you're talking about there. Um, but e even as you've mentioned, you, you, have a, you had a couple, uh, you've walked away from formalism in, in many regards. Uh, this obviously in terms of like, moral like a moral defect can be an artistic defect even if it's not always another one was authorial intent what changed your mind about authorial intent what was that process like well um i think probably the thing that uh most persuaded me was to think about uh or just to ask the question, you know, in, in ordinary in, in ordinary conversation, in ordinary discourse, um, we care about what others intend to say. Uh, we we ask them for for, for clarification. So uh, you know, language is often a, a, a ambiguous. Uh, if I say, you tell me, okay, let's meet this afternoon uh, by the bank. Uh, what what am I going to do? I, well, I'm going to say uh, the financial institution, uh, the uh, the Citibank, or, or or by the side of the river. Um, uh, you know, do do you want me to? Are we going to go fishing, uh, or are, are you going to uh, take out the money you owe me from the bank and 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 finally pay me after all of these years, <laughs> right? So I, I'm going to ask you, you know, what you intend to mean by that. Uh, so much of our, uh, so much of our uh, conversation is about uh, trying to uh, understand what uh, our interlocutor intends, uh, uh, and and we often realize that people don't don't say uh, exactly what they uh, intend to say. Uh, uh, but but we 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 correct for that. Uh, people often use the wrong word uh, uh, to 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 get something a, a, a across. Uh, one of my favorite examples is 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 fulsome. Uh, nowadays, when people want to uh, uh, congratulate you fulsomely, uh, fulsome it, it replaces. Uh, words like very 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 extreme uh, ex extremely <laughs> extreme congratulations to you but actually one of the the, the meanings uh, uh, that used to be a more primary meaning of fulsum was disgusting right <laughs> I did not so, know that so, so you would you would actually be saying to somebody um, i'd like to give you some disgusting congratulations <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> I, 
Has, yeah. Here's some disgusting praise. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve disgusting praise. Not, yes. Uh, and you can understand because, you know, too much praise can be disgusting. Uh, I yes. mean, that's what the connection is. But but uh, really, uh, um, if somebody tells you uh, that, that they'd like to offer you dis disgusting praise about your uh, pod, uh, fulsome praise about your podcast, be, you know, don't be so happy about it. Uh, yes. Okay, so I'd have to uh, know. Yeah. So look, the po the point I'm trying to make is that we really what we really care about in ordinary conversation is what people intend. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, we even know that in when when you get in 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 uh, uh, a, a, a fight with your partner, you know, uh, <laughs> you you said uh, you know. Um, I don't you know, know what you're talking about. Look, looks like <laughs> that is it that that. Uh, um, that dress is a little garish, isn't it? And and, and, and he, 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 the response you get is anger. You say, "Oh, I was only joking." And, and <laughs> your correctly says, "Oh no, you weren't. I know what you intended to say." Um, so, in ordinary conversation, intention is really important. So, so then it just seemed to me to uh, natural to ask, "Well, why should that be different with artworks? Why should it be different with?" Um, where where these debates first emerged was with literature. Why should it be different with literature? Um, and and uh, that puts pressure on the people who want to say the intentions don't count to to say why. And and very often they say, well, because uh, literature is 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 different than ordinary language. Uh, Roland Barthes, for example, who uh, talks about the death of the author, uh, right. He says, uh, well, uh, that the, the reason is that, and this is an ontological claim, a metaphysical claim, he says, well, look, lit literature is intransitive. Uh, what he means is that ordinary conversation is transitive because we, we want to get things done. You know, you go go into the cleaners and you say, "I, I want you to get this spot out of out of, out of these pants," uh, or you, you know, uh, just think most most of our our, our, our exchanges uh, uh, are aimed at, at at making some change in the world. Then what what Barth is saying or, or claiming is, "No, no, no." In literature, um, everything is intransitive. So um, in ordinary language, we do care about what our interlocutors intend, but supposedly this is different. We just care right. about language. So that's, 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 that's one, one kind of argument. Or another kind of argument that the slightly more sophisticated one uh, 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 that was offered by Monroe Beardsley was that, uh, you know, uh, when, people, we, when people make assertions uh, 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 in ordinary language, we, you know, uh, what we want to know really is what they believe because what they believe is going to be uh, 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 connected to their behavior in all, all, all kinds of ways. Um, but he says, but, but when uh, the poet uh, makes an assertion, uh, what she's doing is really just representing the act of assertion. Just as when uh, uh, an actor on stage says, uh, "I don't know," uh, to to his uh, uh, to his father, "I'm going to kill you." Uh, the actor is not making an assertion; he's a, it's a representation of his, an assertion. So uh, basically, the idea here is, or, or that what what Beardsley is claiming is that, look. Um, uh, literature is different than ordinary discourse because it, it trades in representations of assertions rather than real assertions. Or in other words, all, all literature is fiction. Right. But uh, that's clearly wrong. Right? There, there, lots of literature is full of assertions. Lucretius, is, being a philosopher, I, I want to uh, um, throw some business my way. Uh, 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 Lucretius is uh, of the nature of things is is full of assertions, uh, but even in fictions there are assertions that are made. Um, you know, in the beginning of Moby Dick, Melville is actually making some assertions about wh whales. He's not making believe <laughs> that whales have right. these properties. He wants you to believe that whales have these properties, uh, among other reasons, because he wants whales to strike you as creatures noble enough 
to have uh, this story told about uh, one of the greatest of whales. Uh, and uh, uh, Tolstoy in, in, in War and Peace has all of these uh, sections on the philosophy of history. He's making yeah. assertions. Um, so the, what I'm trying to get at is the, 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 the uh, notion that uh, um, all literature or all art is ontologically or metaphysically different than ordinary uh, language requires uh, uh, the proponent of that view to give us some reason to think that they are. Yeah. The burden of proof belongs there. And, you know, it, 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 this, this is not an argument that ends with my declaring that. Uh, but it, it seems to me that uh, uh, most of the uh, claims about what makes for the difference uh, is uh, uh, not uh, able to sustain scrutiny. Yeah, and it feels like uh, what they've done is they've made a uh, bunch of ontological assertions as the default largely pr to protect, and, and maybe I'm misstepping here, so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this, um, that movement from Kant's disinterested pleasure to art being about disinterested pleasure and so because they took that as default and i think you were talking about this earlier with unmasking uh how the these things that we think of as intuitions are actually theoretical choices right that's what's happening here is that they say this is the default because we know this to be true but this is actually a theoretical choice that is actually a logical step that <laughs> it's not what Kant was saying. And I don't know if that, I know that's quite a, a chain there, but is that, am I tracking with you? Well, it, it, there's a, there, you know, it's a, it, there's a, a development. Uh, that, that's the, the right way of uh, looking at a, a development, but there, there are more steps in between. For example, yeah. uh, uh, most, most, uh, People nowadays, autonomous, would not not be talking about disinterested pleasure. Uh, right. they'd, they'd be talking about aesthetic experience valued for its own sake. Where, uh, look, one of the reasons, one of the problems with the the notion of disinterested pleasure is we've got two things. So there's there's a question of of, of uh, the interested component, but there's also a question about the pleasure component. Uh, a, a, a cursory view of art history indicates that not all art is about affording pleasure. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Bosch's visions of hell were meant to disturb people and make them worry uh, about their, right. their, their sins. Uh, all kinds of horror and, and distress often is uh, uh, the the aim so things that we would not describe as pleasurable, uh, so that uh, uh, instead we talk about uh, a, a aesthetic experience where the experiences uh, can be broader than pleasure, uh, but the requirement is that they be valued for their own sake. So we 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 move uh, away uh, gradually. Re remember, I said that uh, when we get to Bell. Uh, he's not talking about beauty when he talks about significant form because he thinks that most readers will think he's talking about sex. Uh, but he also doesn't talk about uh, disinterested pleasure or even pleasure at all. He talks about aesthetic emotion. Aesthetic emotion, he's, he's, yes. He's uh, broadened it. So when you come to someone in the 20th century like Monroe Beardsley, who then is going to define art in this autonomous tradition, um, he is going to say art is something that's made with the intention to afford some amount of aesthetic experience. Uh, that makes sense. Now he yeah. also, if you notice, has, has gotten away from formalism. Uh, he hasn't said that the aesthetic, exp uh, Bell claimed that, that uh, aesthetic emotion was caused by uh, the formal structure. Uh, Beardsley has uh, has left that open. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, as a result of uh, uh, challenges to uh, certain versions of of uh, or, or autonomism, 
uh, adjustments and refinements have been made. Damage control has been done. Uh, and, uh, uh, Smoking uh, like a true heteronomist, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, you, 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 you've, you've captured kind of the the gist of the development, uh, although um, uh, it, it, things, uh, the development over time is, uh, as probably you anticipated already, uh, is is more complex, uh, and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, small adjustments that that are made that have big consequences. Absolutely. And I appreciate that you brought up those complexities. Um, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around all this, so uh, I'm perfectly fine with acknowledging I made some missteps there. So thank you for bringing up those, those important, uh, those small but important steps. Um, I want to be uh, aware and uh, respectful of your time. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you again. It, this has been an absolute joy to have you on. Uh, for our listeners, if you could give them one takeaway uh, from today's discussion, what would it be? Um, well, one is, uh, instead of using the, into the intimidating term of heteronomy, my point is really that uh, art, art is, is, is part of the conversation of the culture, um, and it enters that conversation in, in, in multiple ways. Sometimes it really is about itself, but that's kind of one one conversation that we we have. But very often it's about, uh, uh, for example, uh, morality. Very uh, often it's about uh, people learning uh, uh, what kind of feelings are appropriate in what kind of situations. Um, in kind of every way, uh, art plays into every kind of conversation of the culture and uh, um, somebody will say well yeah doesn't everything else doesn't religion even sports does that and it's true uh, but this is where I think you have to be uh, a pluralist uh, and I, I think that it, it given that the conversation is so important in all of these different dimensions it should be. It should should come as no surprise that um, I'm not trying to talk about this anthropomorphically, but it should come as no surprise that ev evolution has developed uh, uh, many redundant uh, channels uh, to to perform uh, uh, the same function. So uh, art, art art is one. Uh, religion is another. Uh, in terms of of of, of morality, say um, sometimes they work together, sometimes not. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it's so important to fostering uh, uh, cooperative behavior uh, in in the culture that it's not surprising that that there are there are multiple ways of doing it. That virtue can be taught uh, through novels, but it can also be taught by uh, Sportsmen and and sportswomen and and their behavior, uh, uh, courage can be taught that way as well, um, and just as well as it can be taught by movies, uh, 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 and uh, 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 the the culture it, it itself uh, uh, so depends on uh, our conversations and discussions about these kind of things. Uh, that it has multiple ways of doing it, um, and art is one of them. Uh, what a great summary of what we've been talking about today. Um, Dr. Carroll, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun.